Uh, we had um, we had a very nice exchange last week <coughs> in the in the Japan Sangha in the Japan meeting class about the very basics of Bhagavad Gita. I think it was a little bit. I tried to start from the very beginning of Bhagavad Gita, and what's a bit uh, strange about today is that. Uh, Jayananda Maharaj wanted us to start at the very end, the very end of Bhagavad Gita. So as you remember, Bhagavad Gita is in many ways a journey. A journey from uh, a meeting of Krishna and Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. And the start of a discovery for Arjuna of his spiritual life. So, in the very first pages of Bhagavad Gita, we know, as everyone knows, I suppose, we start with a dilemma of Arjuna, an existential crisis. Should I fight or should I lie down and die? Should I fight or should I, should I live in my soul? And this is the start of a discussion. An exchange with Krishna about what the soul is, what the soul means, how much, what it means to say that we are a soul, the relationship between the soul of Arjuna and the soul of Krishna, and the relationship between the soul of Arjuna and the soul of all other jivas, all, all the other living souls. And when we haven't together gone there yet, maybe some of you have read these pages. But the journey starts with Krishna explaining to, to Arjuna that he has a soul, that he is not his body, that he is not a soldier on the battlefield, that he's not a prince, that he's not wealthy, that he's not beautiful physically in mid material. But he has, that he has a soul. And then over the course of the chapters in Bhagavad Gita, this knowledge of the soul is deepened. I think we talked about it in, in my Bhagavad Gita class that the first three chapters are explaining what it means to be a soul and not a material body. And then we go on to understand once we know that we're a soul and not a material body, and the next three chapters explain what kind of relationship we have to God, given the fact that we're made, we're a soul and not a, a body. And then this knowledge of God and the relation between the individual soul and the Paramatma, the super soul, the soul of God, is explained and deepened. <clears throat> so in a way, the, the, the book of Bhagavad Gita is a journey towards deeper knowledge deeper knowledge on the one hand of the self, myself, yourself, everyone's self. That's what's so beautiful about it. It's universal. It applies to everyone. But on the other hand, it's also a knowledge of God. And the key to the relationship to these two sides of the story, knowledge of the self and knowledge of God, is that they're the same, or they, they return to the same. This, by the virtue of this idea that when we are created by God, it's also our soul that's created, and that when God's soul is expanded into the creation, then a little bit of God's soul is in each of us. A little bit of the... God's soul is in each of us. So the relation between the word Atma, very special and beautiful, beautiful Sanskrit word, which means both soul and self. Atma, soul and self. In the West, these two ideas are completely separated. We have a self, it's intelligent, an actor, an ego, a doer, a consumer. <laughs> And we have a soul, which is something religious or spiritual. 
but in in the Vaishnava tradition, these are the same words, same idea, atma, soul and self. So who you are is what your soul is really just inspiring in itself. So that individual soul, the atma, is actually a part of the param atma, the super soul, or the soul of God, or Krishna. So it's even in the word we can hear it, the atma and the param atma, the individual soul and the super soul, they're linked together. This means that the path of Bhagavad Gita of discovering the individual soul, discovering who I am, who you are in your, in your individual experience, is discovering who God is in you. Also a very strange idea in the West. Discovering who you are is uncovering who God is in you. What form God takes in your own heart. That's that's the story of Bhagavad Gita, but it's also the story of our devotional practice. When you do your meditations, when you do your practice, when you sing, when you chant, when you do parikram, when you do all these things, you're trying to clear away the rubbish around your soul in order to see the divine there. Not to, be, not to see somebody who's different from the divine, but to see very exactly the divine in yourself. And that's what Krishna is helping Arjuna to do throughout this, the Bhagavad Gita, the story of the Bhagavad Gita. There's lots to say about this, and I invite you to, to join the Bhagavad Gita class where we talk about a lot about chapter 9 and chapter 10. But the verse, the chapter that Jainanda Prabhu wants you to talk about today, hear about today, is 18, the last chapter. The last chapter. And already, when I say the last chapter, I get a big heartbeat in my chest. Because the last chapter of the Bhagavad Gita might, must be something very special. And it is. <clears throat> Why? Because in the last chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, actually in the last pages, Arjuna discovers, or Krishna tells Arjuna, that he's on the path towards his divine form, his svadup. This is maybe the most important word in all our practice with Gurudev, svadup. It means form. It could be the form of, a, of anything, the form of a fruit, the form of a song. It could be the form of a body. But in our sense, it means the form of our soul. Your soul, your soul, whoops, a bit of an echo now. Your individual soul is unique. Each one of you there. I see uh, 50 different little screens, 50 different beautiful faces. And each of you has its own soul, unique, created by God. Each of your souls, each of the 50 souls I see, da, 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 smiling and beautiful. Charana Gati has a big splotch of blue uh, color on her face from, uh, from Holi, but okay. It's also beautiful. Um, it's individual and unique, and it's always existed. Your soul was not born. Your soul will not die. Your soul has always been there. That's how beautiful you are. From the beginning to the end, you've always been there. Yes, it's true. Your beautiful soul has passed from one body to another. From one 
material form to another? No. From life after life, reincarnation to reincarnation. But you are Sadhu. In our sense, your spiritual form, how you look as a spiritual being has never changed. Never. I repeat, never. You've always been what you are. But the big question for us is, what are you? What is it that you are? And our practice in bhakti is trying to find that out, trying to show you the path so you can go back to where you are. What, sorry, what you are. Because as we know, living in material life, we forget who we are. We get involved in work and we get involved in, in the material pleasures of everyday life. We get distracted by this and by that. And what happens is that we forget who we are. We forget our soul. We forget our soul form, our, our sparuk. And that's that's uh, that's a terrible that's uh, that's really such a, a terrible thing because your soul is the most beautiful thing there is. Your soul is older than Taj Mahal. Your soul is older than the pyramids. Your soul is older than the sands of the desert and the Amazon forest. It's what was there before all of that. So this is the beauty of our project, of our path, that we're trying to, all of us, find our way to uncover the soul from all the dirt that we piled upon it, from, from being egoistical, being clinging to the, to the things that we do, and, and focusing only on, on material pleasures and, and, and material tasks. So this last chapter, now I'll try to come back to what my task is. This last chapter of Bhagavad Gita is trying to tell us what it looks like when we arrive. When we arrive at who we are. And according to Bhakti, according to Gurudev, according to our dear Jananda Maharaj, it's completely possible to arrive back at understanding who you really are, what your svarup is, what your spiritual form is, that thing that's existed through all time. And to put it really simply, much too simply, because it's difficult work, we're all doing it and it's difficult work. The path to finding who you are is finding the divine in you. Seeing the divine in you, taking away the coverings of your eyes so you can see the divine in you. And the way the divine in you looks in bhakti is it looks like love. Love is many things. One thing that's sure about love is everybody knows what it is. I could say, I could ask you, could someone tell me what quantum physics is? And maybe some would say yes, and some would say no. And I could say, could somebody tell me, tell me uh, how much a rhinoceros weighs? And some would say yes, and some would say no, but everybody knows what love is. Everybody has at least a little experience of love. And our strategy as bhakta, our strategy is to follow that little trace of love. 
and make it bigger. Put in our fingers in the hole of that shining light of love and open it up and make it bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until there's nothing left of us but that love. And there you will have arrived at who you are. There you will arrive at who you are. Who you are is what your svaruk is, is pure love, pure shema, divine love. And that's what, to get, to get back to my task for today, that's, what, um, that's what's happening in this last verse of, sorry, the last chapter of Bhagavad Gita. So now I'll, let's go look at it a little bit more closely because this is what Janan asked me to do. We're in chapter 18. And he said we should look at verse 55. And there he is now. Jai ho, Radha Radha. So nice, turn on the Thandavat Pranam. I was just, I just uh, finished a kind of introduction. Wow. And uh, now we were just going to look at the verse 55 <laughs> with your mercy. <laughs> so mercy, uh, verse 55, I was going to say mercy 55, but that's the same, I think. Mercy 55 is about how we, like the chapter, the whole chapter 18, it's about how we find our way to knowledge of, of God. And like I just tried to say, Prananda, while you were still away, how finding knowledge of God is finding knowledge of pure love and finding knowledge of who we are. That who we are as Jivas, our individual souls, is the divine in the form of love. That's what I just said before you came. So Bhagavad Gita puts this in, in this way, in, in verse 55. One can understand the Supreme Personality as he is only by devotional service. I repeat, one can understand the Supreme Personality as he is only by devotional service. And when one is in full consciousness of the Supreme Lord by such devotion, he can enter the kingdom of God. So this is truly the, the description of the end point of, of our journey in Bhakti, of cleaning away all the dirt and rubbish from our hearts and finding the pure divine love inside. That's our, that's our goal. That's what we're looking to do. And the Bhagavad Gita says we can understand God who is the Supreme Personality, by doing this. And Supreme Personality is very important because it reminds us that, that God is not just reality itself. God is not just pure power. God is not just pure beauty or pure perfection or anything that does not live. God is personality, and that means that God is loving. 
So I would even go as far as to replace the word personality with the word loving and say, and then take the verse again, one can understand the supreme loving <laughs> as he is only by devotional service. So I think it's not, I think it's true to say that in our bhakti practice, we understand God to be loving relation. And that's why we focus in our practice on the meaning of the appearance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is Krishna appearing as Radha and Mohan, is not Radha, is not Mohan, but is the experience of love between them. It's loving itself, the loving of God. And this is such a huge thought, such a difficult thought. First, that's <laughs> particularly for people in the West, actually. First, that God should be divided, should split himself in two in order to feel love. But also that God should have a love affair of some kind. That God should have loving emotions on a godly level. This is what's so challenging for us to imagine. But that's what divine personality means. It means God is loving, loving relation. And that means that when we serve God, when we talk about doing our service, we're trying to support that loving relation, serve that loving relation. And in our, in our group, in our direction, we serve that loving relation by imagining ourselves the servants, the Manjari servants of Radha, the goddess of love. So the ideal way for us to serve God, to serve God understand that understood as loving, is to become servants of the goddess of love. Okay. So the, the rest of the verse says that this is only possible by devotional service. Devotional service is, is is the translation of, of bhakti. I didn't read the, the Sanskrit verse, but the very first word of the verse is bhaktiya. Bhaktiya mam abhijanati, which means by devotional service. So we know that bhakti, what we do as bhakta, is devotional service. What is devotional service? It's doing anything for any child of God with love. I tried to say this last week when we had such a nice time together in Mungar Mandir. Bhakti means the practice of doing anything to any other soul with, in the spirit of love, doing it with love. This could mean washing the dishes for your wife. This could mean driving your children to school. This could mean carrying the garbage cans of your neighbor out to the sidewalk. It doesn't matter what kind of activity, if that activity is done with love, and that means without care for whether your neighbor thanks you, without care for whether you get money back, without care for whether you get recognition, if you do it with love, selflessly, then you are taking one step on the path to being a servant of divine love. Divine love. And this says, Father Gita, is the way that we come to know the Supreme Personality. Only by devotional service. The best way is to serve God directly or close to directly. So to somehow become 
Guru Manjari or Manjari and directly serve Radha in the loving pastime. But since most of us are very far from this, every little piece of loving devotion that we can do is bringing us one centimeter closer to God. And for most of us, that is what we can do. You do your work, whatever your work is, do it with love, do it without ego, do it without attachment, do it with God in mind, and you will move forward in your practice. Then the second half of the verse says something more about <coughs> um, the goal. It says, and when one is in full consciousness of the Supreme Lord by such devotion, he can enter into the kingdom of God. Well, enter in the kingdom of God, this is kind of Christian language. Any of the Western people in, in our group will recognize that. But from the Middle Ages, we talk about heaven as a kingdom. So this is this language is the translation is a bit unfortunate like that. What this means is that we can completely realize our divinity. We can completely realize the godliness of our souls. So what we have to do to do that? Well, we have to come in full consciousness. Full consciousness is also linked to the expression that Prabhupada invented, Krishna consciousness. Krishna consciousness means thinking fully, devoting our activities fully, devoting our attention fully to God. So if not only are taking out the garbage for the neighbor with love, but also feeding the children with love, doing our job at the, at the factory with love, driving our car with love, absolutely everything 24 hours a day in our lives is done with perfect love. And then we will enter the kingdom of God. Then we will know God. So if nothing in your day has any ego in it, nothing in your day has any desire to see a payment, a return, a recognition, then you will arrive at the kingdom of God. This is what this means. Devotion means clearing away all of the covering over your loving heart. It doesn't mean importing something from the loving heart shop or ordering a loving heart on Amazon. This means taking care of your own loving heart, which is already loving. Like we said yesterday, already loving for no reason. Endless and causeless. Your heart is already there. We can't explain it. But our problem is that our heart is blocked, our heart is covered. So that everything we can do to uncover it, to do the tasks of our day with full love, that will take us towards divinity. <laughs> Maybe I make a pause here for Jayananda Maharaj, who wants to add, and then we'll read the purport. No, wonderful. Now I have nothing to <laughs> continue. So maybe they don't. <laughs> okay, then Prabhupada's comments on this very important verse. And he says, the Supreme Personality of God, is Krishna, and his plenary portions. So this basically means everybody who has a part of God in her or him, that's you and me. These cannot be understood by mental speculation, nor by non-devotees. 
Okay, two things cannot understand it. One is mental speculation. That means if you try to use logic to understand the love in your heart, if you try to use mathematics or physics or chemistry or biology to understand the love in your heart, then uh, you will not understand God. Yes. And the other thing that will block you is non-devotees. If you're doing your tasks in life without love, then you cannot understand. So God cannot be understood by mental speculation and by non-devotees. Those who try to think with their brains only and those who are not acting through their hearts. And he continues, he says, if anyone wants to understand the Supreme Personality of God, he or she has to take to pure devotional service under the guidance of a pure devotee. Well, we already described what pure devotional service would look like. That means that everything you do, putting on your sock, brushing your teeth, making your dinner, is done with pure love. And it's not easy. We know it's not easy, but that's what that would mean. So that's clear. But then, under the guidance of a pure devotee, why is this important? Well, the most pure devotee I can think of is is our Gurudev. He's the model devotee. He's the best devotee. And why is he so important to us? Because he shows us. He shows us how to. Just a moment for the Barcelona flight. There we go. Goodbye to Barcelona. Now back to Vrindavan. Um, Gurudev is important to us because he shows us how to be a pure devotee. Sometimes he likes to explain things, but he doesn't tell us how to be a pure devotee with logics and with rationality and with mechanics and with physics. He shows us how to be a pure devotion. He shows us that he's an example of a pure devotion. And also, when we associate with our Guru and with other very pure devotees like Jayananda Maharaj, we, we, we take their energy. Even if we're zooming with, with pure devotees, we can feel by the way they speak and by the way they move and the way they communicate and the way they are. We can get this energy which helps us to do the work of being, um, becoming pure devotees. And then Prabhupada continues the commentary saying, otherwise, the truth of the Supreme Personality of Godhead will always be hidden. And this is what I was trying to say, that it's not a matter of importing the truth from, from Australia or something like that. It's a matter of uncovering it within, within ourselves. Un Realizing, this is what realization means. This word that everybody uses, did you have a realization today? Means, did you see a little bit of your own divine heart today? So it's not, you're not, a, you're not a pioneer walking through the Amazon forest trying to discover something new. You're a pioneer in your own heart trying to discover your own heart in a new way. That's what realization means. I realize that I am God. I realize that I have this beauty inside. And realization is the right word because it's not really knowing because I already had it, so I don't need to know it. I just need to figure out and stop being so silly that I don't see it. So I realize that I already had it. 
Prabhupada says, it's already stated, Naham Prakasha, which means already stated, <laughs> that he has not revealed, he is not revealed to anyone. Sorry, this is what I said as well. I think I've read Prabhupada too many times that now I just talk like him without saying that it's his, his idea. But he says it's not a revelation from outside. Something it's a discovery from inside. And he goes on, everyone can understand, everyone cannot understand God simply by scholarship, erudite scholarship, or by mental speculation. Only one who is actually engaged in Krishna consciousness and devotional service can understand what Krishna is. Those are those two things again, right? Understanding that it's not about logics and it is about love. Those are the two things we need. University degrees are not helpful, which Prabhupada put there just to make fun of me because I have seven or something. I don't really count. Useless, totally useless, at present anyway. Prabhupada goes on, one who has, one who is fully conversant, so one who can speak the language with the Krishna signs becomes eligible to enter into the spiritual kingdom, the abode of Krishna. And once again, the spiritual kingdom is the kingdom inside you. It's not the kingdom up on the clouds somewhere. It's not the kingdom in a faraway place or inside a temple in Vrindavan. The kingdom is the one that's inside you, which is why you are so beautiful, even if you don't quite realize it yet. <laughs> Becoming Brahman does not mean that one loses his identity. So becoming a wise person, a learned person, it doesn't mean you need to lose your identity. Devotional service is there. And as long as devotional service exists, there must be God. So if there's a tiny light of love, when you're putting on your children's shoes, and I remember how it is, they don't want to have their shoes put on. And if we put them on with love, anyway, then there must be God. The devotee and the process of devotional service, so all that is there. Just when we feel the love, when we smile when your child doesn't want the shoe put on, and you feel love for the child who doesn't want his or her shoe put on, then you are a devotee of God then you are in the process of devotional service. Then you're well on the way. If the train is left, you're good. Just keep going. Prabhupada says, such knowledge is never vanquished, even after liberation. So now we come to a part where we're going to talk about liberation in a very important way. We've talked about it before here and there in, in classes at Mungir um, Mandir with Jainandra Das and with Gurudev. The liberation is a very special and very important word. Actually, I mentioned it last week. Now I remember. I'm sorry. Uh, when, we, when we spoke last week in Japan, last, I talked about liberation. And the, and the common understanding of liberation of becoming a sannyasi, of putting on the orange gowns, is that we cut, cut our ties with material pleasures. So I put on the orange gown, I'm never going to eat meat again, I'm never going to have sex again, I'm never going to uh, drink alcohol again, or take drugs again, and what's the other one? I'm not going to gamble. These are the four, the four um, rules that uh, are, are common in Krishna consciousness. But that's not what liberation is in bhakti. That's not what liberation means. 
very important to understand this difference. So Gurudev, our Gurudev would say something like, well, that liberation is Vaidhi Bhakti. That liberation is just following some rules which come from outside me, which come from someone who has power outside me. The liberation we want is a different one. The liberation we look for is liberation from an idea. And that idea is that we are our body. Liberation means letting go of the very deep belief that I am my body, that I am my intelligence, that I am the books I've written, that I am the places I've been, that I am the people I've met. Letting go of everything that I have made and owned and knowing that none of that is me, none of that is my soul, that my soul is something different. The moment we let go of that, then we are free, then we are liberated, then we are true sinners. Gurudev tells a story, I hope you've heard it, it's so beautiful. He became sannyasi in, in South America. I can't tell you what year, maybe, maybe Jananda knows or Sumiti, 20 years ago, something like this. He became sannyasi and put on the robe. And he, for one or two days only, associated with the other sannyasis and the group. And all they talked about, he said, was the rules. That they wouldn't do this, and they wouldn't be smoking, and they wouldn't be drinking, and there would be no more sex, and no more uh, this, and no more that. And, and he said to them, just like our beautiful Gurudev would say, that where is the love? Where is the love, he said. And the love was gone. There was no more love. And just about immediately, he took off the rope. And he said, this is not my sannyasa. The sannyasa of our Gurudev is the sannyasa of the heart, which says, I renounce all things that cover my heart, the purity of my loving divine heart. That's the sannyasi. And I think this is the sannyasi that the sannyasi that, that Prabhupada is talking about as well when he talks about liberation. He says, and I continue now reading, he says indeed, liberation involves getting free from the concept of material life. In spiritual life, the same distinction is there. The same individu individuality is there. That I am, I am this, and I can enjoy that. I'm an individual, and I can enjoy that. I can have this material experience. But, so Prabhupada says, in pure Krishna consciousness, in pure spiritual form, it's about a relation to our soul, a, re a relation to who we are and what is keeping us from purifying that relation. All the material coverings that keep us from becoming who we are, from becoming our spiritual form, our soul. Sorry, I just note, I just noticed that, uh, that Karanga is there too. I'm sorry I didn't recognize you, Dandavat. And uh, please uh, comment or make any additions you'd like, you're more than welcome, my dear. Oh. Otherwise, I can As you like, Jananda, you tell me what you want. Uh, uh, you have still time? Yes, I have another... Uh, Another 30 minutes. Oh, yeah, this is wonderful. If you could 
People going on, also God and Asundara Prabhu could uh, share this is a very beautiful verse. It's a pretty wonderful verse, yeah. <laughs> You're mute, Karanga. Sorry, which words? I came late. We're on 18. Five minutes ago, eight minutes. In oh, I see. I see. So nice. That's why I didn't notice you. Yeah. Um, 1855. Okay. So I'll continue a little bit and then I'll let you, you others, uh, comment and share as, as you see fit. I hope it's not too noisy here on the microphone. It's very noisy where I am. Um, yeah, and then the Prabhupada wants to comment about what it means enter into me. So enter into God, enter into this kingdom, which I already said is a bit of an Old Testament uh, Christian, Middle Ages Christian expression. One should not misunderstand that the word dishate, enter into me, supports the monist theory, so the Abrahamic or Christian or Islamic or Jew Jewish theory, that one becomes homogenous with the impersonal Brahman. So Prabhupada means here that when we reach this part, uh, this, this this uh, stage of enlightenment, when we merge with the divine, this does not mean we disappear into the Brahma, the total reality that would sort of dissolve into everything and become anonymous and become just part of the totality, like a big mass of reality. No, it does not mean this. Well, let's, let's listen to him and then I'll explain what I think. So that's the monist theory, that's the mono, the one God theory, the monotheistic theory. He says, no, vishate, enter into me, means that one can enter into the abode of the Supreme Lord in his individuality to engage in his association and render service unto him. This goes together with what I said earlier on today, that you are a totally unique soul, each one of you. Totally unique, totally divine, beautiful, and absolutely uh, uh, endless. Your soul has always been there, older than the Taj Mahal, older than the pyramids. Your soul has always been there and will always be there. Your individuality, your spiritual personality is endless. It means that when you find realization, you will remain as an individual soul. You will continue your service to God on the spiritual level. So, in a perfected way, in a way that's entirely self-present and, and enlightened, you will continue to exist as an individual. You're already special. Your task is to uncover the nature of how special you are, how divine you are. And this divinity will continue once you reach total realization. That's the individuality that Prabhupada is talking about. For instance, he says, a green bird enters a green tree, not to become one with the tree, but to enjoy the fruits of the tree. So you and I are the green birds. And when we fly into the tree of the absolute, we're not there to melt into it, to, be, to disappear into it, but to enjoy it, to be to fully relish it, to fully respect it, fully recognize it, and to enjoy it. Impersonalists, Prabhupada says, 
generally give the example of a river flowing into the ocean and merging. Right? You and I, jivas, we're a drop of water. God is the endless ocean. And when we unite with God, finally, at the highest moment of our experience, we disappear into the water. We become, we can become nothing or almost nothing. This is not the, the conception of the Vaishnavas in which its spiritual particularity carries on. And so the loving relation carries on. The whole force of reality, the force of the absolute truth in Bhakti Vaishnavism, in Gaudiya Vaishnavism, is the loving devotion. It can never stop. It can never stop. God itself is loving devotion. So how could it stop? We will always be part of it. And Prabhupada says, this may be a source of happiness for the impersonalist. But the personalist, like us, keeps his or her personal individuality like an aquatic in the ocean. I'm not sure what an aquatic is. A fish, let's say. So the fish is in the ocean, but still swimming. And the ocean, again, in the last weeks and months, again, Guru Dev speaks so much of diving, swimming on the surface and diving deep. So this image of the ocean is very, very appropriate. And Prabhupada continues, we find so many living entities within the ocean. If we go deep, dear Guru Dev talking again. Surface acquaintance with the ocean is not sufficient. One must have complete knowledge of the aquatics, so the life under the water, aquatics living in the ocean depths. Well, it's beautiful. It corresponds exactly to what we discussed so often recently with uh, Gurudev. And also, since Gauranga is there, I can say that, uh, that he's given uh, some very nice examples of what it is to dive deep into the darkness with very small movements of the body. Very, very inspiration. <laughs> Prabhupada then continues, because of his or her pure devotional service, a devotee can understand the transcendental qualities and the opulences of <laughs> If you were in the class of Bhakti, Bhagavad Gita class yesterday, then you heard me talking about the opulence from the outside, the external opulence, and the opulence from the inside. And the opulence from the outside is something we can see from far and we can venerate and admire and fetishize, but we cannot know it truly. But if we follow the path of bhakti, we can discover the beauty, the opulence of Krishna from the inside. How? By creating a relationship between our heart and the divine heart, our heart and Krishna's heart. This is what devotional service does. Everything we do that where we apply our heart, we associate our heart with God. The more heartfelt service we do, the more deeper we go into our relationship with the heart of God. When we've come to the point which we all aspire to, which we all have as our goal, when only the only kind of activity we do is loving devotional then we know completely the heart of God, the heart of Krishna. This is what I think Prabhupada is trying to describe. And he continues, as it is stated in the 11th chapter, only by devotional service can one understand. And the key word here is understand. Not understand with our brains, not understand with our logics, our philosophy, but understand with our hearts. 
anybody can read the Wikipedia definition of Krishna and understand something. But this is not the understanding we seek. We want to understand with our hearts. We want to understand with our souls. And this is what devotional service can bring us. The same is confirmed here, he says. One can understand the supreme personality of Godhead by devotional service and enter into the kingdom. After attainment of the Brahma Buddha stage of freedom, so this means complete knowledge, Brahma Buddha, freedom from material conceptions. Again, I underscore not from material experiences, but from material ideas, conceptions. It's not just giving up the milk chocolate. <laughs> But it's giving up the idea that that my spiritual identity is 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 made in attachment with material things. So after attainment of Brahmabhuta stage of freedom from material conceptions, devotional service begins by one's hearing about the Lord. When one hears about the Supreme Lord automatically, the Brahma Brahmabhuta stage develops. So when we only think about devotion, when all our activities are done in devotion, that's, that's the automatic he's talking about. And material contamination, greediness and lust for sense, enjoyment, it disappears. As lust and desires disappear from the heart, the heart of a devotee, he becomes more attached to the service of the Lord. And by such attachment, he becomes free from the material contamination. In that state of life, he can understand the Supreme Lord, again, understand with his heart. This is the statement of Srimad Bhagavatam also. Also, after liberation, this sannyasa that we're talking about, this liberation from the false idea of what myself is. The process of devotional service continues. Once again, even once we become liberated from our idea that we are a body, our devotion can go on on the spiritual plane. And that's described then in the Bhagavatam in, in, in Canto 10 and 11. It's really wonderful. We have to have a whole class about it another time. <laughs> in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Abhupad says, real devotional liberation is defined as the reinstatement of putting back, putting back of the living ent ent entity in his own identity his own constitutional position. So if, if Guru Dev were on this uh, class, he would be shouting Jai Ho. He would love this sentence. Because once he would agree that once we, the living identity is linked up to its identity, sorry, the living entity is, is connected to its identity, which is its soul, its constitutional position, its farup, then we will have succeeded. Then we will be successful. The constitutional position, the svarup, the thing we are, the place we started, and the place where we're going, is already explained. Every living entity is the part and parcel, fragmental portion of the Supreme Lord. That little bit of love you feel in your heart right now, right there where you're sitting, listening, working, caring for children, caring for a wife, doing your job. That little bit is part and parcel of God, right in you, right in you. Therefore, his constitutional position is to serve. Being who you are means to serve that little piece of love you feel 
which is actually not a little piece of love. It's a very big piece of love, but it's covered up. After liberation, this service is never stopped. Even when your heart is purified, you will keep serving. Actual liberation is getting free from the misconceptions of life. And that, continue, and that concludes the purport from uh, verse 55. Maharaj, I give you I give you the floor and I will sneak away and uh, catch my airplane. Thank you, thank you, much. Thank you so much. Very beautiful. Yeah. And uh, much today, love to you all. Today, I, I, I don't know, this is realizing maybe, I don't know, speculation, but I feel this bus. Now, Raganuga explanation to this, you know, I, I don't know, maybe one can understand the Supreme, person, Supreme Personality as he only by his devotional service. Who is the devotional service personification? I, I, I would like to understand this is the kind of Radha Rani, you know. Who can who can do most devotional service? Who can do most pure devotional service to Krishna? This is Radha Rani. And then when one is in full consciousness of Supreme Lord by such a devotion, who is full, full consciousness of the Supreme Lord? This is Radha Rani. Then he can enter into the kingdom of God. But I want to interpret this is enter the Nikunja Seva. Because this is uh, Bishate, this purport say Bishate means that one can enter into the abode of Supreme Lord in, in his individuality and engage in his association and render service unto him. So this unto him, if we understand Radha Mohan together, then we could understand this Nikunja Seva. Very nice. Sure. sure. <clears throat> when one in full consciousness, mm -hmm. the Supreme uh, Lord of Personality, mm -hmm. it's for Shopopada, it's like Sinan. Uh, Srimad Radhika can be, oh, sorry, first is Krishna, can be Ananga sometimes, in multiple consciences. And Srimad Radhika, in the past times, sometimes also can be Ananga. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But who is always in two consciences? Anjari? Oh. Okay. <coughs> and by such devotion, that soul can enter into the kingdom. <laughs> we can find this uh, word kingdom in as uh, uh, rather rather's place, Christian's place is together, the big kingdom. This not to mention just the bishop in his enter, Tadantara is therefore after. So that after we can enter, but I did not mention clearly. So this. So maybe we, we interesting, yeah? Full consciousness is rather also manjari. Then we can the end, enter the, the most intimate place. <laughs> it's Nikunja or Nibrit Nikunja. Also, I found out this, this very interesting, this purport. As long as devotional service exists, they must be God, the devotee, and the process of the devotional service. This same is Sambanda, Abhideya, Prayojana, maybe we may also understand. Means we need Ishtadeva. We need Swarupa. We need Seva. Also, you know, in our our Raga point of view, we may understand this 
we need Ishtadeva, Ishtanista, and Swarupanista. And also we need Seva. Also, this Prabhupada mentioned this last purpose. This means after liberation, the process of devotional service continues. In Srimad Bhagavatam, real devotional liberation is defined as reinstatement of living entity in his own identity, his own constitutional position. That means real spiritual liberation is to attain Swarbhasiti. So this is Prabhupada indirectly mentioned Swarbhasiti, <laughs> I feel. Moranga, <coughs> uh, Ji, you said this final conclusion of Prabhupada, and I remember in Chaitanya Charitamrita, Prabhupada is giving, mentioning Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he is giving these two types of persons who are attain liberation. Impersonalists, like we already talked about that, but also he is giving example of someone who attained liberation through Swarup Siddhi. And he said, Brahma Bhutta Prashanatma for Vaishnavas, for Rasik Gaudiya Vaishnavas. It means to attain Swarup Siddhi. Yeah. And this kind of liberation is, this is a two types of this kind of liberation, Swarup Siddhi and Vastu Siddhi. And he said, Swarup Siddhi, it means that devotee in this body, in this life, attain his desirable goal. He attain prema, he attain his spiritual identity, he attain Ishtadev, and he is doing the seva even if he is still in this body. But when he attain Vastu Siddhi, it means that this body is just vanquished and he is in direct seva without living anymore in this body. He attained his natural vastu position. So he is giving example what does it mean in personal revelation? And what does it mean for Vaishnava? Personal revelation. To attain Swarup Siddhi and then one more step, Vastu Siddhi. And we, we can say seventh goal of life. Rasa Darshan. <laughs> So it's, I just remember this because uh, Prabhupada is, I forgot the purpose of this long time ago, I read it uh, from this Bhagavad Gita. It's so nice. Everything is here, actually. Yeah, this is awesome. Everything is here. Amazing. Oh Amazing. I, I'm reading now and it's really all the points which are very important. What does it mean? Like you said, Sambhada, Bideya, Prayojana, Bhagavan, Bhakta and Bhakti are not separate from soul and no one can destroy this so this is our natural constitutional position to always have a goal to whom we want to serve with devotion with bhakti and in that way person becomes bhakta because person cannot become bhakta if he doesn't know whom he wants to lovingly serve. 
<laughs> this is artificial. <laughs> Outside, by the like over there, it says this is a way. But if person knows, this is my loving Ishtadev, my beautiful, sweet Radhika, and she is my worshipful love, then I will try to serve her. And in that way, devotee person, sorry, person automatically becomes devotee, not because he is wearing the clothes, he is putting the tilak outside signs. No. <laughs> so, so nice. No one can escape from devotional service, even if he hardly tried. <laughs> and this is the reason why Krishna is saying after many, 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 many lives, he is again coming in the same position <laughs> to try to attain relationship with me. So Krishna's name is a Hari. So yeah. Krishna will take you know everything material also. He's still our heart. So and once our heart is is stolen, it is difficult to escape. Like what I understand. It's not possible to escape. <laughs> it's just illusion. It can go millions, milliards of kalpas, but again we will soul has to come in the position. Brahmananda Brahmite. Kona Bhagavan Jiva. When he will receive again this opportunity in the form of Rasika Association and in the form of starting again this devotional service to attain final goal. And this is really very nice and deep meanings what Prabhupada said. What does it mean really to enter me? Isn't it Jayanandaji? You read it somewhere. Enter me. It's so deep meaning is in this. Impersonalist really wants to enter <laughs> in Krishna. But Prabhupada enters me means enter my heart. And if someone enters in someone's heart, it means that he really knows this personality. And Prabhupada very nicely said, science of Krishna consciousness, and second thing, science of self-realization. Everything is a science. He's he using this word science because he knows that our minds are always working like this. But real science of Krishna consciousness is to attain personality embodiment of love who has deepest and in most intense love for Krishna and that is Shiradika. Like Jayanandaji said, this is real Krishna, person who is really Krishna consciousness. Science means relationship, spiritual relationship, and how to develop this spiritual relationship. This is the real science. And another science is how to develop my spiritual identity fully, and this is self-realization. Science of self-realization. Science of attaining, how to attain perfection in spiritual identity. Swarup Siddhi. True science of Krishna consciousness, relationship. <laughs> and it means enter to me. This is how I came. And this also, I I feel this, you know, 55th Sanskrit to say, Tato man tattoba to gyatoba. Man tattoba gyatoba. 
if we say like a literary translate uh they after my tatoba after knowing my tatoba then the grandpa translating how <laughs> translate amazing when why the full full consciousness of the supreme lord by such devotion tatoba means full consciousness of me oh my god <laughs> this, is, this is a very deep translation. And this tattva is possible only to understand true rasa. True. So, without rasa, it's not possible to understand the truth. Mm -hmm. Real tattva. So this is a big, huge mistake when we when someone tries to understand truth without relationship, without rasa. <laughs> so, in Chaitanya Charitamrita, do you remember uh, which verse? Maybe, maybe Sanatana Shiksha or Rupa Shiksha. Uh, it, it, uh, Sanat, Sanatana or Chaitanya, I forgot. Please explain. Krishna Tattva. Radha Tattva, you know, Rasa Tattva, or maybe Ramana is a conversation. You know, all Tattva, please explain. So you <laughs> mentioned Tattva is not only truth, but also relationship, some Rasa also including. This Pavupada translation is very, very, very you know, impressed on me. Oh my God, how can we, you know, how can Pavupada translate like this? You know, for me, difficult to translate. Yeah, because the practical example is if we like some cake mm. and if we know all ingredients what are necessary for the cake and we know the recipe for the cake mm. and we know in which temperature must be baked mm. in the oven. Everything, everything we know. But mm. if we didn't taste that take, it means that we know just the tattva, theory. Mm, theory. <laughs> but yeah. we didn't taste. We have we didn't. But when the person is tasting something, it's not necessary that he knows all details of recipe. It's not necessary. It's not necessary to know all the jnana, all the karma, all the other tattvas, but if the person receives the mercy for tasting, yes. then all tattvas are becoming situated in his heart. Mm. Yes, Radhe Radhe, can I add something to sure. all of your nectarian words? I thought that discussing with Gurudev about this many times, he mentioned that what for impersonalist is the Z, the last, you know, like liberation. For the Bhakta is the A, is the beginning. And that whole verse is about that. So Vishati enters into me, I like your uh, interpretation, means enters into my my dear one, service. Mamikam sharanam raja. You enter into me, Krishna says, if you serve my beloved Radhika. Open mic. I don't know what's happened. Somehow you are muted. Yeah. Sorry, we are muted. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Your word is very nice. I remember discussing this subject with our dear Gurudev. That what for impersonalist understanding or, you know. End of 
Because when you want to enter Krishna, when you want to enter into his, you know, confidential uh, abode, means bring down and down with service, you have to enter the service of the amount of the And that is where our, service, our love starts and our feelings start. And that is real entrance into Vrindavan. And that is for us as we age, that's when it stops. And that's why I like your uh, into the kingdom of God means we can enter or try to beg for the sort of foolish. That is our, uh, you know, A, we would like to be a servant of Srimati Rakta, of Shivani Love, but how to enter into that service means to develop a relationship with her through her Dasi. And where do we meet this Dasi in this world? In our beauty. In the one who has revealed to myself that he or she is the divine Dasi of Srimadhi Radhika. <coughs> so that is how to learn, how to understand the divine kingdom of God. It's nothing like an old traditional Christian conception. It is a very uh, uh, unexplicable, beyond the senses realm where you know we are we are entering into each other's hearts by feeling each other and by serving each other. So I like that very much that you put this point. And another feeling that came to me is that how much gratitude. And how much mercy we have gotten that now after so many years we are reading the verses, we are you know, quoting the verses, but now we feel the verses in a rasic way. And that is the mercy of a rasika Vaishnava, of someone who is realized in their eternal position as a lover of the divine. Because before it was not possible. It was not possible. How can we come to these feelings? But we express what we hear from you, Goranga, and you, Jananaji. How we can come to these feelings? Because they were given to us. It's like it must happen. If I say, please, if I can say something. Because I'm so thankful to, I haven't been from the beginning. I don't know who chose these words, Udavaji or uh, your mic. <laughs> okay, I'm so thankful to, I don't know who chose these words because I never, I read this purpose maybe 10, 12 years ago. And now when I'm reading this purpose, it's completely new dimensions are opening. Like Suniti said, and it's only mercy of Rasik devotees who are giving us completely another pure, another angle, Rasik angle. Although I don't know nothing about Ras. I, I'm not diving in the rasa, but because of their help, their emotions, they are opening our heart, not only eyes, heart, that we can relish this beautiful purport of Prabhupada. Like Gurudev said, I, I cannot stop reading this purport, really. And when we finish this Zoom, I will continue to read because it's every sentence of Prabhupada so beautiful, so beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you, my dears. And you remember mm -hmm. these things where you look through, no? what are they called in English? Kaleidoscope, you know? <laughs> it's like, I think uh, what Gurudev has given to us, what Shila Prabhupada and all our teachers have given to us, but maybe we have not been aware that our hearts have been prepared to look at it. It's like in every moment you look through it, you see another beautiful flower arrangement. 
So in every moment, we look at these things now, these beautiful purports or these explanations of the Supreme Lord and his abode. It's like a new flowery impression we get. Yeah. Isn't it? Yes. And it seems to be never ending. It seems to be so tasteful all of a sudden. It's not dry knowledge. You know, sometimes we are thinking, oh, Bhagavad Gita is a basic book. <laughs> yeah, we're you know, thinking like you know, we are thinking, you know, Gita is basic book. You know, you don't need to read so much. But uh, mm -hmm. I was surprising, you know, oh my God, this is uh, actually very deep. Radhe, <laughs> Radhe. Oh, our God. Who is oh, there? Look, we hear some voice. Yes. From the flower. We have internet again. Stable <laughs> internet again. Jai Ho. Wow. It just took some weeks. <laughs> <laughs> we were in Mono. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to add on your wonderful points you made. Uh, Goranga Sundara said it's a science, so it's the science of love in this in this uh, book here. Robert wrote his deep understanding, but it's like a recipe. Without the person who loves the ones he's cooking for or baking for, you will not make the same cake. It's not possible. Even you have the recipe. So many times we have this experience. We distributed prasadam. And people wanted to have the recipe because they said, Oh my God, it's tasting so nice. I have to have this recipe, please give me. So then we gave. Some weeks, months or years later, when we met the person again, the person said, I tried, but it didn't taste like that. I don't know why. There's this scientific secret of love. If the lover is cooking for the beloved, then the recipe is full. And in this verse it is said, when one is full conscious of me. If the, the one who loves him is not giving you the taste, is not giving you the hidden ingredients, you will never ever be able to make this cake. So we need Radharani, we need the teacher of this law of ingredients for that recipe. And Prabhupada, I can feel he had this ingredients, but he was hiding and because our Gurudev was actually opening our eyes, now we have the sentence for these ingredients. And slowly, slowly, we also feel a bit. And I hope Stop. frozen. frozen. And one time, make this recipe full together with Radharani. Jai Shri Radhe. Thank you. Thank you. We are very happy to hear your voice and your your face with brothers and lady. And um, I, I just wanted to say about the kingdom of God also. Actually, 
it is very clear what is the kingdom of God. It is said that Krishna cannot be moved without pure love. So the kingdom where the, this uh, cake is bacon and is eaten, it's the kingdom of love, of course. It's the kingdom of pure love, of Mahabhav. And this means it's the kingdom of Radharani. And this is the home of God. You know, I think it's very understandable that uh, these like Christianity based or like tinted words were used. But now we can also use the words that are more, how do you say, touching the mood of Vrindavan, no? like the Kunjas of Vrindavan or the home, like over uh, Goravani just said. That the home that we want to enter now is Vrindavan, the home of our Shimati Radhika, where is her home? Yeah. And that is the kingdom. That is where Krishna is the carefree prince of Vrindavan. Mm -hmm. So it's becoming, uh, you know, illuminated by the mercy of Sri Guru. And also, I found that this Prabhupada mentioned Raga Bhakti. This is uh, a little bit the end of our book, middle of, you know, as lust and desire disappear from the heart of the devotee, mm -hmm. he become more attached to the service of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Such attachment, mm -hmm. kind of some laga, or you may say greed, mm -hmm. then he become free from material contamination. Rati. Rati. And then he can understand the Supreme Lord. Jai Ho! Yes. Yeah, this is also a very beautiful verse. Mm -hmm. I would um, mention. So actually, today, many Japanese were there. So I was, I was selecting so very important verse for Gita. And uh, I would like to hear from Uttabaji, especially this 54 and 55 and, and so on. So how he will explain that is, uh, you know, I was thinking and then today, If we lead very, you know, if we lead Pahupad Pahapot, we found out many things. This is un unexpected, honestly speaking. But Pahupad is, you know, really amazing. That's why they say it needs one to feel or to understand one. It needs one Rasika Vaishnava to understand and feel another one. That's what's have been happening to us by the mercy of Guru. Or it's still going on that this feelings to go, you know, to understand the feelings of Prabhupada, where he's coming from, from which point of feeling in his service to Srimati Radhika, to his Guru Mandari, is being revealed by our Guru Mandari, by our Guru how he feels him, and mm. that's the secret mm. in devotional service. Mm. It takes one to feel one. Otherwise, it only stays in the mind, in the brain, in the intelligence. Mm. And it doesn't feel, mm. uh, you know, it doesn't sink in the heart. So Guru Dev is a, like a story thing. Uh, please keep going on this international uh, Zoom Sangha and to, how do you say, to enlighten each other, <laughs> to, to help each other or to maybe discover 
much time. Yeah, yeah, together. That is a good day with wanting us to do this. And just now I want to share with you the, the basement mm. of Gurdiv where he doesn't live anymore. He has shifted now to room 108, which is the room by the green tree, you know, at the left side when you come from his old room. He has been given this room now because it's more convenient for his health. He can have fresh air immediately from the entrance and it's smaller and he has a small bathroom. He doesn't have to go many stairs and the air is more becoming. So it was today I felt really touched when I came down and I saw the whole basement, Gurdiv Cave, is full of devotees. <coughs> and there he is on his chair again. And then uh, devotees got uh, spiritual names. They got Hari Nam initiation. And, you know, I just, I had a nostalgic moment. And I thought, oh my God, it's never going to be like this again. You were in, we were in this room with him for many years. Mm -hmm. We were sitting to his lotus feet and always we could come and ask. And every time he would be ready to answer all the questions to, you know. And now it's like another area, mm -hmm. you know. He is more taking care of his bhajan. He said, now I am retired. I will do bhajan. And it gave me also some more hard feelings because he was predicting that years before. You know, he said, you don't know, but now you can come any minute to me, everybody, any minute, whether it be day, whether it be night, you can sleep here, you can eat with me, you can discuss with me, you can fight with me. <laughs> I'm so available. I mean, he's the most available person I guess I have never ever met in this lifetime mm -hmm. as a teacher, as a guru, you know? Mm -hmm. Usually a guru is like 10,000 disciples or I don't know what. And if you are lucky, you can, you know, get some, something like closeness or a feeling maybe. Once you've got one vision. Whatever, yeah. Uh, you know, it depends on your relationship. But, but now, and then, uh, you know, at that time he said, you don't know, but now you are so... You, everything is so carefree, but there will be a time where I'm not speaking much anymore. And I thought, oh my God, I wish this time will never come. But at this moment, I feel it is coming. And it makes me quite nostalgic, you know. Honestly, when I saw this today, I thought, my God, it's, uh, you know, rare to see him down there again. And it's, it will be rare that he will be talking like he was talking with us before day and night it's still there but it's like a different mood now different. we want to also you know we want to see that Gurdiv has his time for restoring his health and restoring his voice and just a few days ago he said to me well yes yeah, getting better but still i feel i'm only in 50 percent 50%, he says, you know, and he was honest. And, you know, in the mornings now he's getting ready. We had Diksha. No? In the morning we had Diksha yeah. with nine uh, lady uh, the disciples of uh, Ma Hima Bhaktigiri, and that was very touching. And Gurudev, for one hour, he explained the Gayatri mantras. But after that, his voice was, you know, like broken. It's, it's like... Uh, you know, and then he said, open the window, I need fresh air, open the window, you know. So, so I just realized that um, everything is, is changing in this material world. Everything is in a constant change. So to be, I feel so much gratitude today for what was and for what is right now and take the chance to associate with Gurudev deeply. He's now giving, I was just in my heart lamenting and I felt, Gurdiv, I don't want to lose you. And I thought, oh, what am I talking to myself? I have to find you now. I have to find you on the deepest level of our relationship. Gurdiv is withdrawing from an external point of view. He's not available every, you know, every 24-7 of the day. You cannot just go there and sit with him. The room is very small. It's limited capacity. He's giving us services. And he says, I want you to be my voice now. 
they were his words. And that is also our service to protect him, that his health can be as good as it could be in this stage. And also that to go inside, not see him like an external body, but where's my relationship to Buddha Manchuri now? How can I more deeper connect it and uh, at the same time do my services here externally as they are needed? I just wanted to share this just like a life report from Mungeraj Mandir with Kurt. Thank you very much for sharing this. I think that many devotees need this sharing some information and also your feelings and devotees around you. Thank you very much. Because many of us, we are not calling so often Guru there because we try to yes. <laughs> yes, not put a burden on him and to, to push him. But in the same time, we are burning inside and this kind of kata also is helping us that at least some small drops try to help us in surviving this situation and this which is very beneficial for for on one side because we like you said we have to it's the sign clear sign that we have to go deeper in our spiritual relationship not only through body to body thank you Radhi, Radhi. It's are very nice. Yes, I feel the same. And this burning is a good burning. I feel the burning even here in Vrindavan, I must say. <coughs> no, it's a burning of old uh, concepts of my relationship. Because I, I feel that Gurudev is withdrawing himself, not in a negative way, but in a positive way to say, okay, now you've had so much mercy so much association now let's meet there you know let's burn the old habits of this bodily perceptions and let's go and grow you know like today i had really one second i had this feeling my god this must be how shrimad radhika feels in a way that we are together but we are not together you know i feel that something is in our relationship is developing on a different level that we are together, but we have to be separated more. You know what I mean? It's a, you know, it's a craziness. <laughs> like, a, like I say, like a parent getting old, mm -hmm. and sometimes son and daughter mm -hmm. take some responsibilities, mm -hmm. and uh, what I say, makes father or mother be more what I say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, free or comfortable or more safe, more, I say, more, more relaxed. This is slowly, slowly, this time is kind of, you know, approaching, unfortunately. That's a feeling also coming. And the good day was so much today, he said, Oh, I'm very tired, but he forced him to do initiation and many things because of his love. How many initiations did you do the whole day? Whole day. No, oh, no. Morning? Maybe Sati, Sati one, including Diksha. My one. Nine Diksha and 20... Maybe eight, eight Diksha. Eight Diksha and 20 and, and some. 20, uh, 22, 20, 22 Arina. I don't know, maybe Sati, something. I just remember when Gurudev was telling about his guru, when he was just sitting there and said, if you have a question now, just sit nearby. And the question will find an answer itself. So I feel that actually what what love we can give him is the atmosphere that he is going deep now, completely deep diving in, because this is his wish. He said this here and there in between, maybe not, not too loud or not so loud, but 
Actually, he said it again and again, and he said also that he wishes to hear from all of us, and he wants to dive in. So let us do this nice service for him. And as Prabhupada said, or Siddhanta, Bhakti Siddhanta, our love will be shown how we work together in love. Yes. So, Panama Gurudev, Gurudev is a Gurudev, is a Bres, Bres Sadmaraj. Your disciple never fight. So, we need to let the phone go. Hello, everyone. Thank so today, much. yeah, today is, I think here maybe Kartik final day for us. Today is Ekanasi. I think full moon is the last day, no? No, no, no. Some day ago. Ekanasi to Ekanasi is this moon rise is standard. Okay. Yeah, and some Godiamata is going to start, uh, you know, Purunima to Purunima. And uh, so today, I, I think, you know, our Kartik. Nyama Seba is complete. Yeah, complete. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.